This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Ladies and gentlemen, this weekend our show features Dr. Carmen Dorabat. You might be familiar with her work at Mises.org. She is a terrific up-and-coming Misesian scholar, I grew up in Romania, so she knows what socialism is all about, studied under Dr. Guido Holzman, was mentored by our own Dr. Joe Salerno, so you know she's a thoroughgoing Misesian. And that's what we talk about, how Mises influenced her, her work, and also how Mises still matters to an up-and-coming generation of Austrian scholars. You're going to love this interview, so stay tuned. You gave us this introduction to a series of nine lectures that Mises delivered in 1951. As you point out, he was already about 70. Just amazing output from this guy. Um, you know, one of the things you point out is um, that really his – if you had to to distill his work down into maybe three big – buckets, which would be tough to do. But you, you, you basically say his scholarly career is, is method, calculation, and money. So j- just elaborate briefly for us. So if, if you look at the way Mises' um, career started, so he, he started by working on monetary theory. And, um, you know, from Menger and from Bombaric, it was on money and interest. But very soon, I think you can start to see that he realized what a central importance money has. It's not just a separate, you know, issue in economics, that it's at the heart of all economic analysis. And he realized that by looking at the importance of the calculation debate and realizing that, you know, there is no such thing as a barter economy. You need money. You need money prices in order to have a fully developed economy. And in order to, if you need money prices, then automatically, you know, central planning um, is impossible, you know. Um, but, and and as he developed, you know, and just working, and he started on a very practical line in this sense, you know, just monetary theory, figuring out some things, criticizing some things, disagreeing, you know, filling in small gaps. I think as his career progressed after he moved to the U.S., after human action, he starts to publish a lot more on epistemology and praxeology and so on. Because he started to realize, okay, but why are people not talking about money the way Austrian economists talk about money? You know, why is money put in a separate box in the rest of, you know, um, economic science, especially in mainstream economics? And it's a problem of method. It's the way we you know, conceptualize economics, the way we make abstractions, the way we think about, you know, human beings as homo economicus or rather from a praxeological point of view and so on. So it's not three separate things. It's just three lines of inquiry that he kind of went through. You know, monetary theory on one hand, calculation, it's just basically applying all the insights from monetary theory and explaining how markets work. And then, you know, this sort of meta level of the epistemology you know, what's interesting is Guido Holzman told me, he said, in a sense, he thinks that the theory of money and credit, give, given its tie when it was written and Mises' relative youthfulness, is actually a greater achievement than human action. I think I've heard Guido express that view. I think um, it's worth asking him exactly. <laughs> I didn't get a chance to ask him exactly what he means. I mean, um, in a sense, it's more. It's a lot more focused, and in a, in, a, in a sense, it's. Um, and I, I, I can see where Guido's coming from. If I remember other similar discussions having with them, that you know, the the theory of money is at the heart of economic theory, in a sense. Um, so maybe perhaps not not to put words in his mouth, but maybe maybe Guido's trying to hint at the fact that, you know, focusing on monetary theory just automatically illuminates other other discussions and Mises didn't necessarily have to do those discussions in human action, where he basically takes these insights and develops them further into other areas. So maybe maybe Mises spreads himself a little thinly by by tackling so many issues in human action. Maybe that's what Guido's trying to say. Um, But I do disagree, though. Uh, (laughs) Just to finish, I do disagree. I do think, I do, I mean, human action is a tremendous piece of work because it stretches across um, such a vast area. It's basically, you know, it's the theory of economic science. And while theory of money and credit is really great, I do think that an older... Mises is actually better. 
And as you point out, I mean, he's so comfortable talking across disciplines, across various scholars. I mean, nobody writes overarching treatises today. Today, academics are hyper-specialized. Yeah, it comes back to what we were saying about the PhDs, right? I mean, in in the U.S., they push you for hyper-specialization before you've even gotten your PhD, which is not what Mises got. I mean, Mises, looking at Guido's um, biography of Mises, you know, he used to study Latin and rhetoric and ancient Greek when he was uh, in secondary school. And then, you know, his um, his PhD thesis and his habilitation thesis and so on were real proper books, real proper uh, researches. If you look on Guido's website as a side note, when he describes the PhD program, he'll say, I want you to write 200 to 300 pages, not three papers on so-and-so, um, <laughs> which is a very typical, you know, reaction to this kind of thing. Um, and because of that, he's able to go, you know, um, across disciplines. Um, and he does it in human action, too. And what's even worse is he assumes readers can follow him. You know, so he won't he won't put footnotes or explanatory notes or anything of the sort. He'll leave um, quotes in Latin untranslated, assuming, of course, I mean, who doesn't know Latin? Or, or, or he'll phrase it, it is very well known that Fisher's quantity theory of money <laughs> is wrong, you know, and it's like, of course. And normally in today's world, you would expect a list of five or six, you know, citations, in-text citations following that kind of statement. But Mises is like, no, it's, it's well known. No, no one's going to, you know, challenge me on that. Everyone knows. But imagine a brilliant PhD quant, a 28-year-old today working at the Fed, Ivy League pedigree, knows nothing about World War II or nothing about... Uh, about classical languages, or you know, they're not an educated person in the Misesian sense. No, and 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 I think it goes it goes further beyond that. I remember um, back when I was a fellow, some um, some 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 students who were doing a PhD or a master's at the time were telling me um, that they had colleagues, you know, in their class who were extremely good at math, but. Having looked at it, I think it was like a holiday calendar with economists, and it had the picture of Adam Smith and David Ricardo and Hume and so on. And not only did they not know or recognize them by the pictures, but they didn't really know who they were. You know, like, well, it's it's David Hume. You know, who? And and that's the thing. I mean, Latin and ancient. Okay, <laughs> I could I could compromise that, but um, you know. People will barely know who Irving Fisher was. Economists, you know, or like highly trained, as you say, young graduates won't necessarily have heard of him. And I think I think generally, I mean, I was trying to put together a program in economics here, and I had to fight to put a couple of classes on the history of economic thought. Because they told me it's not, you know, I told you about the bureaucracy here, you know, it's not according to the standards, it's not included here in the standards, maybe you should have, you know, more basic math, because it's in the standards. Um, it's very sad. No, 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 it's it's considered, it's it's the Whig theory of history, but in, in economics, right, it's um, newer the better. Why do we need to know? Well, in your in your intro to these nine lectures that I mentioned earlier, you have a, a sentence, I think, which really sums up Mises on money, uh, illuminated the fact that the determination of the purchasing power of money is accomplished as part of the same market process that creates the structure of money prices and brings about the division of labor, thus making it clear that monetary analysis must be an integral element of economic analysis, end quote. So what what's so what's so great about this sentence and about these talks is that first of all we you know we we understand how staggering it is that Mises applied the concept of marginal utility to money. But we also doesn't this also lead us to a conclusion that in the there's no Misesian micro or macro per se. No, no, and I think I think Mises oh, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I think he explicitly denies that the um the, the he denies that there's there's a, a significant distinction between short run and long run. You know, long run is just a, a composite of short runs. Um there's no such thing as a the economy in the short run, the economy in the long run, the economy and the macro elements and the economy and the macro elements for sure. 
I mean, as I, as I also say in the introduction, you, you know, uh, that's that's what Rothbard remembers primarily from learning from Mises. You know that um, that the um, the economy is a coherent whole. It's a one big structure. You can't study a part of it without other parts. And you can't talk about prices unless you talk about money prices. Um, this was, this was Mises' whole point. You know, once you have indirect exchange, once you have a commonly accepted medium of exchange such as money, the barter prices that economists talk about, they don't exist anymore. They're just, just, they're just gone. They're not under... You know, like real prices are not under nominal prices. They're not like hidden under. They just, they're gone. Because those, in order for a price to exist, a transaction needs to happen. And there are no barter transactions anymore. They're just money transactions. So the only thing that actually exists are money prices. Um, and it's fascinating that economists, you know, will talk about the economy pretending there's such a thing as a as a barter. I mean, it's easier from, it's, it's easier and a lot more mathematically elegant to do it. That's why they do it. You know, it's a lot messier if you try to put money in. Um, but Mises was adamant in saying, you know, otherwise money just doesn't exist. I mean, you can't just add it later and, uh, you know, pretend it doesn't change much. Let's talk in closing here about the term Austrian economist. I like to think of it as a loose term of convenience to describe a, 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 a predominant body of thought that came from some, literally from some Austrians and then later on from some next generation Austrians. Uh, Salerno basically says an Austrian is someone who sticks with the praxi praxeological paradigm. In other words, somebody who says, well, we draw inferences from premises or actions. Um, and that it's this methodology that really distinguishes an Austrian from, let's say, uh, some other very uh, free marketer. So is Austrian a label you embrace? Do you think it's become cumbersome? Do you think it's it, it causes needless division? Or is it something we ought to be uh, uh, planning our flag proudly with? It's, it's nothing. It, it hasn't really bothered me at all. I mean, and I do, I do, I am aware of the debate, and I do, I do find it funny sometimes that people, you know, um, l like to make sure that what the, whatever they're calling themselves or whatever label they put on themselves is the uh, quite accurate um, label. I think Mises always, well, but Mises evidently never referred to it necessarily as Austrian economics, other than in the historical sense in which you talk about, you know, I mean, the, the school of, of, of Menger and Wieser and von Bavark. Um but in general, every time Mises writes, he just says economics or economists, and that's pretty much how I've always referred to myself. I mean, I don't think I don't think I've ever used for myself the term Austrian economist. I've just called myself an economist because if you do accept that whatever Mises or the Austrian economist or the Austrian school teaches you is actual truth in economics, you know. If what Mises writes in human action, if the praxeological approach is the true approach, is the right approach, then there's no point in calling yourself something that's maybe some maybe the mainstream economists should call themselves something different. I don't mean I don't know. I've never had I've never had an actual opinion on this. It's just I never felt the need to distinguish myself because I've always thought, well, the whole point is to, you know, to reveal the truth of economic science, the way Dr. Salerno talks about, you know, economics as a vocation or as a profession. If you understand it as a vocation, it's all about figuring out the truth, and it's figuring out the truth in the science of economics, and then you're an economist, and that's it. And that's what Mises was. That's what Rothbard was. Okay, and if you enjoyed hearing from Dr. Carmen Dorbat, we're going to present a longer print version of this interview in our January-February version of The Austrian. That said, ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.